Lecture five, the nervous system. Nerves tingle and tell us of what we are not but. What are we but nerves? Clearly we have fun writing those. Things. All right, here's our buddy, um, Galen. Um, <clears throat> well, before we get to Galen, yeah. The word brain is uh, Proto-Indo-European in its uh, origin, meaning that it is a really, really old source of mystery. A really, really old source of mystery. Very prehistorically, before uh, there was any concept of this country or that country, India uh, or uh, Europe or Africa, uh, the word brain draws its origin um, linguistically from the word, mreg, I don't know how to pronounce that actually, uh, mregmino, mregmino uh, which then became bragnon, uh, which is what we use as brain now. So the brain itself uh, has been recognized to be a, a important source of the human being from the very beginning of human beings. In the 4th century BC, about 2,500 uh, years ago, nerves were controlled by and originated in the heart. Uh, this was Aristotle. He got it wrong. He got it wrong. Um, hot on his tail, 600 years ago, Galen tried to clear up this mystery. And uh, I think I have, I think I must have read this quote in one of the, in the previous uh, lectures. I've shown in my book, uh, plugging his, his book here, on the teachings of Hippocrates and Plato that the source of the nerves of all sensation of voluntary motion is the encephalon, or the brain, and that the source of the arteries and of innate heat is the heart. Okay, so uh, the word neuron, or nerve, uh, comes from the Greek word neuron, uh, which means sinew or tendon, reflecting Aristotle's misunderstanding of uh, the, the, the fundamental um, st structure of the nervous system. Uh, by the 12th century, this guy Moses Maimonides, uh, that I had also talked about in the past, says, quote, one who is not knowledgeable in anatomy may mistake ligaments, tendons, and cords for nerves. Picking up, trying to steal Galen's thunder uh, for a new generation. Uh, by, the, by the 15th century, at the turn of the 16th, by means of nerves, the pathways of the senses are distributed like the roots and fibers of a tree. So uh, this uh, Benedetti, Alessandro Benedetti, um, begins to understand that nerves are how we sensate things. Nerves are how we um, begin to draw information uh, from the uh, environment around us. Uh, and then following that is uh, the famous Leonardo da Vinci, who understands that it's not just sensation that is being called from uh, the external environment via nerves. There are also the pathways for control of the musculature. Um, so he, they, between Benedetti and da Vinci, we get this afferent uh, and efferent um, paradigm. Afferent meaning pulling information from the outside up to the brain, and efferent brain sending signals out uh, to the rest of the body. All right. So uh, here is a sort of modern uh, depiction of this very same, these very same ideas that are quite old now, uh, that we pull sensory information from the external environment. This is the afferent, uh, this is the afferent function of the nervous system. Then the brain and the central nervous system and the spinal cord has an uh, integration of this information. We process uh, the information that we're pulling in from the sensory system. And then we have some sort of control that is exerted via the efferent um, output of, of the brain and central uh, nervous structures. Um, so <clears throat> here in this diagram, the central nervous system is depicted in uh, the dun color, uh, this sort of this drab color. 
which is uh, the brain and the spine, and then the peripheral nervous system is in yellow. So from um, the uh, base of the thoracic region down, all those ganglia and peripheral nerves are part of the peripheral nerve system. All right, so here is the, the hierarchy of the nervous system. Uh, we have the central nervous system, which is broken up into the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, which has somatic nerves, and then uh, the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that is fully outside of voluntary control. Um, and that is broken up into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches. The, the sympathetic, uh, reductively, the sympathetic uh, nervous system is the fight or flight uh, branch, and the parasympathetic is the rest and digest uh, autonomic nervous system. And then finally, there is the enteric nervous system. Uh, that is the nervous bundles and ner the, the plexuses and the plexi and, and ganglia of uh, digestion, so the, um, the enteric nervous system, which is a little bit outside of um, the hard wiring of the uh, central and peripheral nervous system. Although there is interplay between them, it is something that is independent enough uh, that it gets its own discrete category as the enteric nervous system. We will not talk about that in any detail at all. All right. So given these different types of neural tissue that are found in the brain, uh, throughout the body, pardon me, uh, we can classify them. We can classify them um, into these, uh, across these six different dichotomies. Uh, the, the, uh, pardon me, these three different dichotomies. Uh, is that nervous tissue uh, that we're looking at general or special? All right. Uh, a general... Um, a general nerve would be something that is going to your muscles or pulling back sensory information from your skin, just general sensorium or general motor uh, fibers. Um, and special would be like your eyes, your sense of hearing, uh, things like that. The som is it somatic or visceral? Uh, somatic would be a nervous tissue that is dealing with uh, often things on the outside, on, on the periphery of the body, meaning uh, like your muscles would be somatic, uh, the, the cell, uh, the sensory nerves on the outside of your skin. Uh, visceral nerves are nerves primarily of the autonomic nervous system uh, that are innervating uh, the viscera inside your body, uh, the organs, and... Um, in the, in the various autonomics. And then finally, the, the, the third dichotomy is afferent versus efferent. Uh, afferent uh, just means, and these, these are um, very generalized terms, can be very generalized terms. Afferent just means something that's going into a system, so uh, sensory information going up into the brain, afferent coming up into the brain, and efferent means going out of. Uh, so afferent into, uh, efferent out of. Um, uh, something that is uh, affected, it, it is, uh, it's an effect that is imposed upon a system, and an effect is a change that a system has on its on the outside uh, world, right? So, af, uh, effective or effective. Um, and w given these three dichotomies, we can come up with uh, eight different nerve fiber types. Uh, I have them depicted here, uh, sort of like uh, a cube that has six sides is going to have eight corners. It's uh, three dichotomies, that would be two to the third power, so eight different types of categories. We can have general, special, afferent, um, special somatic, what did I say? I said, did I say general, special? No, it should be general somatic, uh, afferent, a GSA fiber, or a special somatic afferent, a general visceral afferent, a general visceral, a, a special visceral afferent, um, and then uh, similarly for 
uh, efferent, um, so the four efferent categories. This kind of nerve fiber type, I'm not going to go into this in ex excruciating detail or really expect you to know this, um, although I'm going to point them out when it's relevant. But that's the kind of, um, that, that having it broken down for you that explicitly uh, will help those of you who go on to um, medical school in the physiology class there. Sometimes it's not uh, spelled out in such clear detail. All right. So um, neurons can be uh, classified functionally uh, as sensory neurons. Uh, these are the afferents, all right? Um, and there's three categories, broad categories of sensory neurons. Uh, the first are interoceptors. Uh, intero meaning inside the body. Uh, there, you know, do you have a kidney stone? Do you, do, your, do you have a pain in your intestines somewhere? They're internal. Uh, monitor the cardiovascular, respiratory, digestive tract, urinary, reproductive tracts. Um, internal senses also fall into the interoceptor category, such as taste, uh, deep pressure, and nociception or pain. Uh, the external uh, senses um, are categorized as exteroceptors. Touch, temperature, pressure, sight, smelling, and hearing, or the distant senses are also uh, considered to be exteroceptors. And then, uh, finally, are the proprioceptors. So um, the proprioceptors are somatic only. There are no, uh, there are no visceral uh, proprioceptors, but they're in all of your joint capsules. And when you go into a position and close your eyes, but I still know that I'm making this weird shape with my body, uh, that's my proprioception. So for example, um, I don't know. Who's the slam dunk king of your generation? When I was your age, it was Michael Jordan, or a little bit younger than you guys. But, <clears throat> you know, someone like that who has, like, exquisite proprioceptive uh, um, mapping in their brain, it's all from these, these proprioceptors uh, um, that, that help to monitor the position of the body. The second type of uh, functional class of neuron is interneurons. And I'm following that, that, that first uh, schematic I showed where sensory information is going up into the brain and then control mechanisms are coming uh, down from the brain. Um, so the exteroceptors, I'm sorry, pardon me, the interneurons, these are um, the processing neurons of the brain, the gray matter of your brain. Uh, also called association neurons. Uh, it is integration. It is memory. Um, it is learning. It is executive function in the brain. The interneurons. We're not going to talk about interneurons too much, except a little bit at the end. Uh, and then finally, the third functional category are motor neurons. This is all of the efferent um, nerve types that you'll, that you'll see. Uh, of the peripheral nervous system. And uh, those can be broken up into visceral and somatics, uh, as I showed in the previous slide with the eight uh, categories of, of nerves. And so these motor neurons um, can control muscle function. They can control glandular function. Uh, we can have nerves going, investing right in uh, to glands. So the somatic um, motor neurons, these are going to the muscles, and, and the visceral uh, effectors are uh, autonomics. These visceral effectors synapse at the ganglia, uh, autonomic ganglia. So a ganglia is a little bundle of cell bodies that's found in the periphery somewhere. Uh, they can be the chain ganglia parallel to the spine. They can be the pterygopalatine ganglia that's behind your cheekbone. They can be the ciliary ganglion uh, behind the back of the eye. There, there's all kinds of ganglia all over the place in your body, which is where we have um, so an efferent autonomic neuron coming out of the brain somewhere, 
synapsing in this ganglia on the cell body of another neuron and then proceeding from there uh, to their target, uh, their, to the target effector. Uh, because of that, there are preganglionic fibers and postganglionic fibers. The preganglionic fibers are the ones that are emerging from the central nervous system uh, and then synapsing on the in the ganglia, and then there's the postganglionic fibers that are going to the terminal destination. These are only for uh, autonomics, the visceral uh, effectors. All right, so this would be either. SVE fibers or GVE fibers, general or special uh, visceral efferent fibers. Okay, um, either of those two are going to have preganglionic fibers or postganglionic fibers. Whew. Lots of different types of neurons, but it's basically uh, just depicting this schematic flow here. So we have up in number one, uh, you feel that your finger is getting pricked. Um, this would be, um, what, what kind of neuron would that be, given this ca these categorizations I just gave you in, in the diagram I have there at one? What would you call that? So it's clearly afferent. Is it uh, an interoceptor or an exteroceptor, a proprioceptor? My finger is getting, I'm feeling the surface of something with my finger. Is that inside the body or outside the body, or is this person doing a dance? You guys are still asleep? Outside. Yeah, so that's an exteroceptor in this diagram here, this example, going up to an interneuron in the brain somewhere, and then it's sending a signal down to a muscle. Is uh, that going to be a somatic or a visceral efferent? So there's these two categories here, somatic or visceral. Is this, is this muscle my bicep? I touch something, it's hot because I'm touching a stove, I've never seen a stove before, and I pull my arm off. Okay, so sensory comes up to my brain via the general uh, somatic afferent fiber. My brain says, whoa, hot, and sends a signal down uh, to the muscle of my arm to pull my arm off uh, the, fl the flame uh, via a general somatic efferent. Or, uh, so it's a somatic, that would be a somatic nerve depicted in that, in that diagram. Okay. Uh, the central nervous system. I told you there were basically two uh, categories, two broad categories. Stru structural categories. There's the brain and there's the spinal cord. So um, the way the, the sort of informational flow for either of those um, is sensory receptors uh, from the outside world are going to send information directly to the brain. This is different types of reflex uh, loops. Sensory receptors send information directly into the brain via the cranial nerves. All right, so information goes directly into the brain through the cranial nerves. Um, you have uh, interneurons there that uh, process that, and then there's an output via uh, motor output via the cranial nerves. The spinal cord has uh, sensory input over the spinal nerves. So these are all the peripheral nerves that you have. And then it comes into the spine, synapses there, and can either, and, and then the motor output is along the spinal nerves. The, this input after synapsing may send information upstairs to the brain. Okay? It may also go to the brain, but it's not coming in over the sensory receptor, it's going up to the brain and then coming out uh, of a cranial nerve via a, a uh, cranial efferent. It would be coming out of one of these spinal nerves, unless there was some higher cortical process that was uh, involving multiple systems. Um, and it goes, all this output goes to the various effectors. And the three types of effectors that we have are muscles, glands, 
and adipose tissue. So uh, right here, we have the four tissue types of our first lecture, no, second lecture, uh, where we have neural tissue interacting with muscle tissue, with epithelial tissue in the form of glands, or uh, connective tissue in the, in the form of fat. Um, fat tissue actually is also endocrine tissue uh, that can be under neural control. Uh, all right. Let's, let's talk about sensory receptors in a little bit more detail. Um, sensory receptors are going to be able to transmit four types of information, okay? The first type of information, a sensory receptor, an afferent sensory receptor is going to be able to transmit is it called its modality. Its modality. Uh, what mode is it taking? And this is where we say, you know, there's the five senses. Uh, taste, touch, hearing, smelling, and seeing. These are the, the supposedly the five uh, sensory modalities. Well, of course, there are many more than that. Like just, just saying touch uh, encapsulates a lot of different things, right? I mean, we have the sensation of light touch. We have the sensation of deep touch, pain. We know when something feels wet. We know when something is vibrating. We know uh, when something is hot or cold. Those are all different sensations within this broad category of the touch modality, all right? Uh, and they all have their own sensory receptors that are going to transmit each of those types of information. Um, within taste, for example, taste and smell, they have made strides. There are some, what I would consider to be relatively either uh, arrogant or deluded scientists who think that they've been explained, um, but I think that's hubris. Um, there's, there's a lot of unanswered questions in my mind uh, that they've explained uh, smell and taste, but they have identified five uh, types of um, five types of uh, sensory neuron. So <clears throat> how are we able to taste the wide variety of, of foods that we do? Um, there's this labeled line code. Uh, so you have right here on the on the left, we have this taste bud. And within a taste bud, there's jammed all these different sensory neurons. Uh, each of the sensory neurons has a specific uh, thing that it's sensitive to. There's bitter, salty, sweet, umami, and sour. Uh, so bitter would be anything that is alkaline in taste, meaning basic. Uh, if you put um, like baking powder in your mouth, and, ooh, ooh, that's that's or like chew on an alkaloid uh, of some sort, like um, like a Tylenol or whatever. Um, salty is is probably pretty uh, familiar to everybody. Sweet, of course. Uh, and umami is um, within, just within the last like 20 years, 15, 20 years, maybe more than 15, 20 years, I guess, uh, was identified as being um, a unique type of sensory receptor. It's given a Japanese name because it was Japanese that discovered this and, and in some ways perfected the use of the flavor. Uh, umami is a sensory receptor that is responsive to glutamate. Um, glutamate is a neurotransmitter. It's also a uh, amino acid. It is what makes food taste savory. Not just salty, but savory. Um, so, uh, for example, a lot of Japanese food uh, uses a broth called dashi, uh, which is made by boiling... Um, uh, bonito, which is a, a dried uh, jackfish, and kombu, which is a type of seaweed uh, 
that grows at the confluence of the Sea of Japan and the Pacific, uh, where two temperature, the temperature gradient there uh, allows this, this seaweed to have a high concentration of glutamate in it. And so they boil the seaweed and this dried fish that also has a lot of glutamate in it makes this broth that's really tasty. Uh, it doesn't have to be salty. Uh, it still it just has a lot of flavor. It's flavorsome to it. So uh, that's umami. And sour just means acidic, uh, anything with uh, like citric acid, uh, you know, citrus fruits are uh, sour, or vinegar is sour. Um, yeah, there's this labeled line code. So, and, and this is a real conundrum. Um, you know, you have a taste bud, and it starts sending signals uh, to the brain. The question was, can a single uh, sensory receptor uh, sensate all of these, all of these different? Tastes, well, no, it can't. There's this label line code. So a single neuron, if that neuron fires, it means the taste buds have come in contact with something sour or something sweet, all right? Uh, if that neuron does not fire, there is nothing sweet there. There is nothing sour there, okay? Labeled line code. Um, the brain then uses these labels to interpret modal what modality these signals uh, represent. Um, to me, there's still some deficiency here. How is it that we're able to smell the, the just dizzying and taste the dizzying array of flavors uh, that we're, we're able to experience? It's, it's still pretty mysterious to me. Okay, the second type of information is location. So there's modality, which is exactly what is being sensated. There's location. Where is it? on the body. Okay, this is going to require some sort of map of the body in the brain. We'll talk about that later, the homunculus. Um, so there's this notion of receptive field. It's the area on this map of our body in the brain that a single neuron is going to, is going to monitor. Any kind of stimulation within that receptive field is going to be perceived as being the same. So your sensitivity or your ability to locate that stimulus is inversely, uh, inversely proportional to the size of the receptive field. Meaning if you have a giant receptive field, not that giant, but you know, a, a big receptive field, then you're going to have relatively poor ability to say where exactly on the body it is. Uh, an example of this would be on the back. So low density of sensory neurons. The receptive fields are big, low, uh, very insensitive, small ability to say exactly where something is on the back. Uh, you can do uh, receptive field mapping if we had more time in lab to actually have a proper lab uh, with something that that I've done in the past with different classes. You take uh, toothpicks and you can map out the size of your receptive fields by taking two toothpicks and putting them right next to each other, the, uh, you know, behind one of the student's backs. The student says uh, they're in the same spot and then you slowly move them apart until they can tell that there are actually two toothpicks touching your back. And you can see how big the receptive field is that's being monitored by a single neuron. Um, if you have a very small receptive field, it means there's lots of neurons packed in per square area on the body, and you have a very acute ability to uh, detect stimulus. Um, and places on the body that have uh, small receptive fields, which have high sensitivity, these are all your favorite spots on the body. So um, your, your lips, uh, your fingertips, um, the genitalia, the, these places where there's high concentrations uh, of nerves and small uh, receptive fields. So, for example, here, uh, these, two, these two pointers are the same distance, but she can't tell that there are two uh, pointers on her back because they're all in the same receptive field. Uh, but they're the same distance here on their fingertip, and it's very obvious that she's getting pricked by two because uh, they fall into different receptive fields, higher density. The third type of information uh, that comes from these sensory receptors is 
the intensity. Um, so there are three different ways that the nervous system encodes intensity. Because um, remember, neurons are frequency modulated, right? Uh, uh, an action potential is frequency modulated. Uh, graded potentials can be uh, amplitude modulated. But an action potential, which is a signaling event, that is uh, sit a little bit. that is um, frequency modulated. So the the strength of that signaling can be uh, dictated by where on the downstream neuron uh, that signaling is happening. Is it happening? on the very periphery of the receiving neuron's dendrite, or is the synapse right next to the axon hillock? All right. If it's right next to the axon hillock, it's going to have much greater effect uh, on the, or effect on the, uh, on the subsequent action potential of the next neuron down the chain, whereas um, uh, if it was not the dendrite, it will have less. Secondly, is how many fibers are um, how many fibers are uh, firing at once? So in the second uh, in the second panel there, uh, you see two neurons uh, that are firing. They're not firing very fast, either of them, but taken together, uh, they're they're depolarizing that membrane quite a bit uh, in the downstream cell. And then finally, um, are they firing quickly or not? The speed with which that they're firing. All right. So, uh, the location of the synapse, or you know, which fibers are firing? Is it ones that are close? Uh, you know, where in the architecture of the brain are they firing? Uh, how many fi fibers are firing? And then how fast uh, are they firing? The ones that are firing, how fast are they actually firing? The fourth uh, type of information is uh, duration. Um, so there's this notion of adaptation. Um, if you're getting constant stimulus, eventually your body adapts to it and tunes it out. There are certain kinds of stimulus that you can adapt to, and there are certain kinds that you're not able to adapt to. This depends on, on um, the receptors that are receiving the information. So we have tonic receptors. These are slow adapting receptors. They're always active. There's not much adaptation. So for, before I say that, an example of adaptation. Um, as you sit there, you are probably not aware. Let's just be quiet and listen for a moment. Now that we're sitting here listening, you can hear the, the air handling uh, in, the, in the building, right? Uh, it's always there. It's been there the entire time we've been in the room. It was there even when I wasn't talking before class, but you weren't really aware of it until I brought your attention to it. So your body, those receptors, the stimulus that they're sending up to the brain has adapted, and they're not sending uh, information to the brain uh, even though they're receiving uh, information from the external world. Those are tonic receptors. Uh, proprioceptors are tonic, uh, for example. The, one, the ones that are telling you about your body position. You're not always acutely aware of the position that your body is, is in. Uh, muscle tension, joint motion. Um, I used to work at a camp uh, for autistic children. And uh, you see these first day of camp, they get off the bus on this time. The first, the first year I was there, these kids all tumble off the bus, and this one kid got off the bus, looked around in like a, a kind of sort of ecstatic, joyful panic, stripped every stitch of clothes off of his body and climbed a tree immediately. <laughs> the point, and, and it was hard to keep his clothes on uh, throughout throughout the week. The, the point is that, you know, this person may have a problem with a central adaptation to the sense that you're wearing clothes. You don't feel the clothes on your skin unless you think about it and then like, oh yeah, I can feel my socks and my shoes and 
et cetera, that autistic person had a hard time filtering out those sensations. Uh, so it's better to just get rid of them. Um, and then phasic are, are fast adapting receptors. They're normally uh, inactive. These are going to give a rate of change uh, of something. Uh, you know, I called, uh, I've been describing all these things as uh, tonic, but they are actually phasic uh, receptors. So uh, I, pardon me for that. I, I hope I, I didn't cause any confusion. Yes, yeah, slow adapting receptors are things that when they're happening to you, uh, you, you, are, uh, you are aware of them. They, they do not adapt. I hope, I hope that, doesn't, that doesn't cause too much confusion. So if they do not adapt, you are aware of them. If, you, if they do uh, adapt quickly, um, then, uh, then they come back to normal uh, rapidly. That, that came home to me when I looked at these uh, charts. So looking at the diagrams, we see the tonic receptors. Um, on, on the bottom panels, we're, we're going to see, the st you see the stimulus strength. Some sort of stimulus comes in at uh, stimulus on and stimulus off. In tonic receptors, we see the, the uh, receptor potential peak, and then it stays on. It doesn't uh, come back to normal. In the phasic receptors, the stimulus comes on. The phasic has the spike, uh, and then the membrane potential comes back to its resting uh, potential, even though there is a continued stimulus on that sensory receptor until the stimulus comes off, and then there's a hyperpolarization. Um, all right, so this is going to give us uh, rapid changes in, um, in sensorium. So um, something like uh, your smell, uh, something that may be crawling on your hair, the movement of your hair, uh, cutaneous pressure, et cetera. Uh, this is in, in uh, contrast to tonic receptors. Did I, did I just totally muddy the waters there a little bit? Does that make sense? All right. OK. So all of these different sensory neurons uh, can be classified uh, thus. So first, you can classify it by fiber type. Uh, the four fiber types in the red box, there's the general uh, somatic and visceral afferents, and then there in the blue box is the special somatic and visceral afferents. Um, you can categorize them in their distribution. Are they interoceptors or exteroceptors? Uh, or are they proprioceptors? And then uh, the modality. We talked about modality uh, as being, uh, are they taste, touch, uh, smell, um, hearing, et cetera. So um, the modality in the general somatic senses uh, are temperature, pain, touch, pressure, vibration, and proprioception. And then there are the special senses and their modalities. These are smell, sight, taste, balance, or equilibrium as it's mediated by the uh, inner ear, and then, of course, hearing. Um, all right. And then functional categories. And these are how um, the, the different fibers are going to be operating. So there's nociception, nociceptors. These are pain receptors. There's uh, fast and slow pain fibers. Uh, fast pain fiber would be, uh, for example, putting your hand on something really hot. Uh, slow pain fiber would be um, something that's activated when you have like twisted your ankle. And it's just this dull ache that you may have. Um, thermoreceptors uh, that uh, are responsive to temperature, chemoreceptors responsive to chemicals, mechanical rece mechanoreceptors, uh, and there's, as, there's a host of those. Um, and the mechanical re mechanoreceptors, uh, back at the beginning of the semester, or maybe last week sometime when I was talking, in, I guess the last lecture, I talked about uh, these uh, receptor channels that had this, um, this kind of thing. And then when you deform the membrane, uh, it, it 
opens the channel. All of the mechanoreceptors are going to have some variant on, on, this, uh, on this theme. So. <clears throat> and we're going to go through uh, some of these uh, functional categories uh, right now. So of the three mechanoreceptors, first the tactile receptors. Uh, there are two categories of them. The first category are free nerve endings. Uh, and the second is going to be these encapsulated nerve endings. So free nerve endings um, are either going to be just totally free nerve endings where the, the, uh, where the, um, the membranes of the, uh, the dendrites of these neurons are just embedded right into the epithelium of the skin. These are tonic receptors that have very small receptive fields. Uh, they tend to sensate things like pain and temperature in the skin and, and the mucosal membranes. Um, a variant of this, a variant of this is the root hair plexus. These are the free nerve endings that wrap around uh, the bulb of the hair shaft. Um, also, uh, um, the, these are phasic, uh, rapidly adapting. They're good at telling when there's been a, a shift in the hair uh, position. So uh, you feel your hair move, it activates them, and then you don't hear, feel your hair move, and you forget that your hair's there. Uh, you, don't, you can't tell that it has moved afterwards. Um, and then finally are these Merkel discs. This is uh, beginning, this is beginning a, uh, they are included in the free nerve ending uh, category, uh, but they do have these associated structures called Merkel cells. Uh, so the, the, the free nerve ending is sort of uh, plugged into the end of these Merkel cells, which help uh, stimulate the end of the free uh, nerve ending. They are responsive to fine touch and pressure. So like very, very, they're the ones that are um, giving you very, very uh, soft uh, touch. Uh, tonic receptors with very small receptive fields. Moving on uh, to the encapsulated nerve endings. Um, the, the first one are these tactile or Meissner's corpuscles. Uh, also uh, sensate fine touch uh, and light pressure. Uh, also very low frequency vibration. Um, and they adapt within a, a second or, or so. Very large structures, you're going to see them up into the dermal, uh, embedded in the dermal papilla. So each of those hills in the dermal papilla are, um, contain these, these Meissner corpuscles. Uh, not surprisingly, you're going to, be, you're going to find them uh, highly concentrated in the most sensitive parts of the body that I'd already uh, talked about with the small receptive fields, the eyelids, fingers, uh, lips, nipples, and genitalia. All right. Uh, next is the lamellated or pacinian, uh, in, in terms of the eponym, corpuscle. The lamellated corpuscle, lamella just means walls, layers. Uh, the lamellated corpuscle, they kind of look like onions in transection. Um, they are sensitive to deep pressure, and you find them uh, in the, at that dermal, hypodermal boundary, very deep in the dermis. Um, pulsing or high-frequency vibration uh, stimuli turn these guys on. Next is the Ruffini corpuscle, another type of uh, encapsulated nerve ending. It has these nerve endings that are embedded in these uh, collagen bundles uh, that are then encased in this capsule. Uh, and this is real like stretching distortions of the skin, like uh, um, uh, sheer stress on the skin is going to set off a Ruffini uh, corpuscle, also located uh, in the reticular layer of the dermis. Um, all right, moving on to the second class of mechanoreceptors, from the tactile receptors to the baroreceptors. 
Baroreceptors just monitor um, change in pressure, and they rapidly adapt. Um, so they're phasic. They go through a quick phase. Um, yeah, so you'll find baroreceptors in the aortic arch, in the carotid bulb, uh, places like that. Um, proprioceptors, these, uh, this is the third class of mechanoreceptors. There are three types of proprioceptors. Remember, proprioception are nerves that are going to give you information about body position, joint uh, position, tension in the, in the tendons. Um, so the three types are muscle spindles, uh, and this is giving you uh, the kind of information that's going to tell you whether your muscle is contracted or not. When you contract a muscle, you, you feel that, that contraction. That's information from the uh, muscle spindle apparatus. Uh, they're also involved in what's called the muscle stretch reflex, or MSR. When you go to the doctor and uh, she bangs on your knee and your knee whoosh, kicks, that uh, is a stimulation of the muscle spindle um, receptor. The next is the Golgi tendon organs. Uh, this is going to tell you about tension that's in the actual tendons or ligaments. Uh, so this is going to tend to be focused around the joints. Um, and then finally are uh, any kind of receptors that are right inside the joint capsule itself, uh, not actually associated with the muscles, uh, but right inside the joint capsules. <clears throat> and this is going to be uh, directly reporting on, on the position of the joints. All right, on to the... Uh, some aesthetic senses, so um, none of the mechanoreceptors uh, any longer onto the thermoreceptors. The bulb of Krauss. The bulb of Krauss, um, funny named structure, uh, it's in the dermis of the genitalia. Um, sometimes uh, sporadically found throughout the skeletal muscles, also in the liver and the hypothalamus. Chemoreceptors, um, these are responsible for monitoring a variety of different chemicals that are important uh, for homeostatic control, such as pH. Uh, related to pH is uh, dissolved carbon dioxide and oxygen uh, levels in, in the blood. Um, we find these also in the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. So uh, the aortic bodies are in this aortic arch that's emerging from the heart. And then the carotid, uh, there's a common carotid that goes up the neck and bifurcates into the internal and external carotid. There's a bulb right there. Um, and we have uh, different chemoreceptors located in the carotid bodies as well. Um, there is adaptation uh, to changes uh, over a period of uh, few seconds. That's peripheral adaptation of the actual neuron. The neuron itself adapts uh, to uh, stimulus and, and ends its depolarization. Um, there's also central adaptation uh, that can happen uh, upstairs as the brain or central system uh, begins to get used to uh, having stimulus of a certain uh, set of, of these chemoreceptors from the periphery. So an example is the carbon dioxide set point. When you have um, people with pulmonary insufficiency, uh, so this could be a person with, um, uh, oh, what's that called? Um, multiple sclerosis or uh, more commonly uh, ALS people who are not able to, to ventilate properly. They're not blowing off enough carbon dioxide. Their carbon dioxide levels are going up in their blood and their central adaptation, their brain gets used to that and changes the set point that it's using to, to uh, compare the circulating levels of carbon dioxide with. Makes those people really spaced out. Um, all right. <clears throat> 
So neurons, that was a functional classification of neurons. Uh, we're going to look at structural in, in very, very broad terms, a structural classification of neurons. There's essentially four uh, structural categories, broad structural categories. Um, the first is this, in panel A, anexonic uh, neurons. The thing about anexonic neurons, um, <clears throat> there is a cell body, and there's all these dendritic structures around the outside of them, but the axon and the dendrites are indistinguishable from one another. So um, there is the functional distinction between the axon and the dendrites, but just histologically, you cannot, or structurally, you cannot tell the difference uh, between, between them. All right? So they call those anaxonic, meaning an meaning no uh, axon. Um, next is the bipolar neuron. A bipolar neuron has two branches, uh, two ends to it. There's the dendritic end and there's the axonal uh, end. And so information comes in through the dendritic end, passes through the cell body, and then um, and then the information emerges from uh, the axon and the synaptic terminal. These are very similar in structure to unipolar neurons. Um, the only difference is that the information, the signal, does not pass through the cell body. It doesn't pass through the cell body. The cell body is sort of uh, on a wing off on its own. So the information comes through the dendrite, and the dendrite becomes the axon um, in these in these type of uh, in these type of neurons. Finally, there's the multipolar neuron. Uh, this is the vast majority of the neurons in in the brain, um, or in, in in the in the nervous system. Pardon me. Um, in, in a multipolar neuron, neuron, as I indicated in the lab is going to have multiple dendritic uh, poles that are impinging upon the cell body where there's this sort of summation of the electric fields uh, caused by uh, each of the dendrites and their signal inputs. And then you reach uh, threshold at the axon hillock and the information comes out through uh, the axon into the synaptic terminals. All right. Um, that's the neurons. On to the neuroglia. Um, the neuroglia are the support cells, the accessory cells that help neurons do what they need to do. And there's, uh, the neuroglia can be separated between the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. Two totally different casts of characters. Uh, they're two totally different sets of cells that have over similar, like analogous functions in the peripheral or the central nervous system, but they're just different types of cells that do similar things, but uh, in two different worlds. We're going to start with the central nervous system. We have uh, the ependable, ependable cells. Um, so these are going to line the ventricles and the central canal. Um, they produce cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there's also specialized ependymal cells that are going to be responsible for um, helping to establish the uh, blood-brain barrier. The astrocytes, those uh, cells that look like stars, astro cell site uh, that we talked about in lab in the slide, they help to maintain, they help the ependymal cells and maintain that blood-brain barrier. Um, they're also giving structural support to the brain, um, and because uh, astrocytes are maintaining this blood-brain barrier, th uh, they're also going to be uh, important in regulating ion flow and nutrient flow. So anything that's getting into the brain is going to have to pass through uh, these astrocytes. Yeah, we'll talk about exactly what the blood-brain barrier is in a little bit without deviating uh, from where we are. Next are oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes are, um, they have two functions. Number one, they act as the insulation in the brain. They're going to be the myelin along the axons. Uh, oligodendrocytes 
also provide a structural framework. They help, uh, they help these axons that are passing in relationship to one another to maintain the appropriate spatial orientation that gives this huge macroscopic tissue its microscopic fine structure, the architecture uh, that is the microscopic, uh, um, yeah, scaffolding, uh, scaffolding of the brain uh, that is in some ways a mirror of our learning. Um, and finally, the microglia. Um, these remove, these are basically like the garbage trucks of the brain. They're going to um, remove debris of any sort. And if there are any pathogens in the brain, hopefully not, uh, they're phagocytic cells. We talked about those in the um, epithelial chapter a little bit. So here's a picture of uh, some gray matter in the brain. Gray matter is made up of primarily uh, cell bodies um, or uh, anexonic neurons that do not have any uh, myelin at all. There is uh, a very low number of uh, oligodendrocytes in this part of the brain because there's not really many axons here. Uh, so there's not going to be a need for um, myelination. Uh, <clears throat> we see the ependymal cells lining the central canal um, and where they would produce uh, the cerebrospinal fluid. And a lot of these uh, astrocytes, which are going to provide the spatial uh, infrastructure, the spatial scaffolding, that are going to help uh, the cell bodies to have the right arrangement with one another and also maintain the blood-brain barrier. Then the white matter, these are axons that have been, are descending from um, the gray matter where the, the nerve uh, cell bodies are. And uh, there's, they're, just, um, they're just forming uh, a myelin sheath over the axons. However, uh, the difference between oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells is that um, a single Schwann cell is going to have a body and then many of these branches off of it that myelinate uh, multiple axons. What's the advantage of that? What do you think the advantage of that is? Why don't we? Do, why don't they just have Schwann cells? That one cell is just—it's just there to—it's just there to insulate the axon. What do you guys think? Make it up. Imagine. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. So explain it a little. You're, you're on the right track. You haven't completely nailed it. Uh, the the, the oligodendrocyte's not involved in synapsing. But what did I say about um, the architecture in the brain of the cells, the, the spatial relationship of the cells? How does it maintain that? So like in a peripheral nerve, um, is it this, is it this big, open, three-dimensional structure? No, it's kind of a linear structure. Everything's just going in the same direction, right? Uh, and so it's, you don't need to maintain the position of axons that may be going like this with one another because they're all just going in this direction, okay? So you just bundle them all together. You pack them in uh, endoneurium and perineurium, and then they'll get to where they're going. In the brain, it's this three-dimensional open architecture, this spatial orientation where things are not all heading in the same direction, but maybe this neuron needs to send something over here, and this one needs to go in that direction. And they need to be heading in those two different directions at the same time, so there's going to be an oligodendrocyte that's going to sort of monitor that and hold them in, these, in this weird open three-dimensional architecture. So it is, 
in terms of connectivity, in terms of spatial connectivity, not really synaptic connectivity. Although the synaptic connectivity, uh, the pattern of synaptic connectivity is a consequence of that. So yeah, I mean, you were, you were on the right track. You had it. Um, all right, and we see here uh, a, a picture of a capillary in the brain. Um, and it, it, the surface of that capillary is totally encased in uh, the pseudopodia from, um, from these astrocytes. So maintaining this blood-brain uh, barrier. Uh, so the brain is full of blood, right? There's tons of capillaries through the entire blood, but there's actually no blood in contact with any neurons. The neurons themselves are totally isolated from the blood. There are not red blood cells coming up to the neurons. Um, they're like all the other stuff that's in the blood can't actually get to the brain. Uh, there's only a very few, a very select subset of solutes and solids in the brain, in the blood, that are allowed into uh, contact with the brain tissue. All this other space that you see around here, this purple cloud, that would be cerebrospinal fluid and interstitial fluid, all right? Myelination. Uh, here in the peripheral nervous system, we have an axon. Uh, we have the um, Schwann cell beginning to wrap itself around uh, the um, axon. And uh, with time, it forms uh, this thick covering of many, many layers of myelin around the outside of that axon. And then that gets covered in the endoneurium, the connective tissue sheath that uh, gives support uh, to this, this whole structure. In the central nervous system, it's these oligodendrocytes. And so it's a pretty similar thing, except you have multiple cells um, uh, or you, have, you have multiple axons being myelinated by the same oligodendrocyte. Uh, the distinction here is that since a Schwann cell uh, is only doing one internode in the peripheral nervous system, the, neuro, the uh, nucleus gets bundled in to that structure, whereas in an oligodendrocyte, the uh, nucleus of the oligodendrocyte is external. Um, okay. So on to the peripheral nervous system, we have basically two types of um, two types of neuroglia. There's the Schwann cell uh, that we've talked about uh, quite a bit, where that forms the myelin sheath around um, around the axon. A whole string of them, uh, one after another, with the nodes in between the, in, um, the, the nodes in between. Uh, and then the satellite cells. Um, so the satellite cells uh, are found in ganglia. Um, they are going to surround the cell body, and uh, they're responsible for monitoring uh, oxygen levels, carbon dioxide levels, uh, and any kind of nutrients or neurotransmitter uh, that may be a wash around these per peripheral neurons uh, in, in the ganglia. So the satellite cells, um, are these going to be more involved in the autonomic nervous system or the somatic nervous system? You remember? What did I say about ganglia? What's a ganglia? Uh, so just think about the word gang, ganglia. It's a bunch of cells. It's a gang of cells. It's a little bundle of cells that's found in the periphery nervous system. And your autonomics, your visceral nervous system, is going to go uh, to a ganglia synapse. And you have the preganglionic and the postganglionic fibers. Uh, that's where the satellite cells are. So they're involved in the visceral nervous system, the autonomics. All right. <clears throat> Let me think. Um, 
jack. Get it easy. Number one. Cerebral. Cerebral. Easy. Uh, Tanner. Number two, A and B. Um, Thomas and then uh, the hypothalamus. Yes, good job. The hypothalamus and the thalamus together. Do you remember what, what that, uh, this, is, this is hard, I'm pushing you. What's the thalamus and the hypothalamus together called? The diencephalon. Okay. Nice work. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at three? Midbrain? Go ahead, Dale. Oh, you got it. He's having to snake you. Yep, that's the midbrain. Um, okay, I followed on you, Taylor. Do number four. You got it. The pawns. Nice work. Uh, all right, who wants the fun one? Number five. Robin? Um, it, the spinal cord emerges from that part, emerges from that part, but it has, uh, it has a kind of funny rhyming name. Is that, yeah. Medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata. Yeah. And then finally, um, number six. Who wants, who wants that one? Eliza? Um, the volume of the brain uh, across lifespan is uh, from postpartum to um, to uh, the the flower of life is 750 uh, cc's up, up to a little over two liters in volume, and so 97 percent of the neural tissue in your body is in your brain. That's where most of it is. Um, the average brain weighs about three pounds. Um, all right, so uh, stepping through the functions here, uh, the, cere uh, the cerebrum, this is where we have our conscious thought processes, uh, our intellect, anything that you are aware of uh, or decide to do any kind of volitional uh, volitional control in your body originates in the cerebellum. Um, then the diencephalon, which is composed of the thalamus and the hypothalamus, um, this is where we're going to have relay, uh, the thalamus in particular is where you have relay centers. Uh, so if anything is going to reach uh, the, conscious, the conscious brain, the, cere uh, the, the cerebrum, is synapsing in the thalamus, all right? If any kind of stimulus is going to be something that I am aware of, then in that process, there was a, there was a synapse in the thalamus, period. Okay, so the thalamus is very important. It's a, it's a big relay station. Uh, the hypothalamus um, is particularly important in uh, the limbic system, the emotional system, uh, and in controlling uh, the uh, pituitary gland, the hypothesis, uh, which is um, the central organ of the endocrine system. So the diencephalon is a very important part of the brain. Uh, the midbrain, um, there is, so the midbrain is responsible for uh, maintaining your consciousness, right? So that doesn't mean that everything you choose to do and everything that it is like the part of you that thinks of you as you is happening in the midbrain, but without the midbrain, you become vegetative. Um, so it, it is necessary for maintaining conscious, uh, consciousness, although all of the qualia that are associated with uh, that is in the, the cere cerebrum. So the way I, the terminology I use to distinguish it is the midbrain establishes consciousness and the cerebrum establishes volition. Um, uh, and then you also have, uh, it's a big processing center for visual auditory uh, information in the corpora quadrigemina there. And um, there's a lot of reflex synapses that happen there as well. The pons is also another, um, I mean, so the whole brainstem is a big uh, relay station. There's a lot of synapsing that happens throughout here. Uh, the pons 
uh, is to the cerebellum as the thalamus is to the cerebrum. Um, there are a lot of subconscious uh, uh, somatic and visceral uh, relay stations happening there. So subconscious is, uh, so for example, when LeBron James or whoever goes up for the layup, they're not thinking to themselves, okay, I need to contract the gastronemus while I am using my gracilis to do all this. They're, that's not conscious. They're not unconscious of it. They're just, it's just subconscious, right? They could think of, while they're doing it, they could think about their calf, but they're not thinking about the calf. So it's, they're not asleep. They're not unconscious. They're just sub, it's subconscious. So that, um, the cerebellum is involved in coordinating a lot of these subconscious activities, these coordinated uh, activities, and the pons is a relay station for that. Um, and then the medulla oblongata we talked about in lab is responsible for a lot of core uh, bodily functions like breathing, digestion, uh, heart rate modification. All right. The ventricles. Uh, we already talked about the anatomy. I'm not going to do that, but um, the ventricles are full of this cerebrospinal fluid. Um, it circulates throughout the ventricles and surrounds the exterior of the brain. Um, it is produced by the choroid plexus, uh, these special ependymal cells that, um, that line the surface of the thalamus and other places uh, throughout, the, um, throughout the ventricles. They are resorbed into the blood uh, th this cerebrospinal fluid is resorbed into the blood uh, via the arachnoid uh, granulations, and we'll see a diagram of that in, in a moment. What does the CSF do? Well, it first of all functions as a fluid buoyancy, so it it, it cushions the uh, the brain, keeps it floating, uh, and protects it from shock. Um, and then it also offers. Uh, the chemical s stability that the brain requires to function properly. So it's giving it uh, the nutrients the brain needs, the brain exclusively, it's very finicky, the brain is picky about its diet, it only eats glucose. Um, and uh, there are various chemical messengers that um, are in the CSF and waste nutrients are uh, excreted into the CSF and then removed by the arachnoid granula. So before I talk about the production of uh, and resorption of CSF in more detail, we need to uh, get a better sense of these meninges. I already kind of anticipated this in, lec in lab. Talked about the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, and the pia mater. Dura, durable mother. Um, there are two layers of the dura mater. There is a periosteal layer. That's a layer that uh, is right along the surface of the bone. Um, and then there is a meningeal layer. There's a layer that's down uh, pointing towards the other meninges. Uh, these two layers diverge from one another, uh, as you can see, along the superior sagittal sinus and form this deep venous structure along the crest of the brain that is draining blood uh, off of the brain down uh, into the jugular system. Um, below the meningeal layer of the dura mater is this arachnoid mater, the woven mother, mother the spidery woven mother of, of the brain. Uh, and this uh, layer has these particular structures called a, uh, arachnoid granula that uh, push up through the, um, the surface of the dura mater and, in, and act as pouches up into uh, the superior sagittal sinus. Um, they are taking the cerebrospinal fluid that is laying over the surface of the brain um, and they are uh, exchanging it back into uh, the venous blood. Uh, to be taken away from the brain, all right? And then 
below all that is uh, the, the Pia Mater, which is a very, it means tiny mother, uh, Pia Mater. And it, it's lying uh, right on top of the surface of the brain. It's just a thin membranous coat on, on the surface of the brain. Okay. So in the inset uh, to the right, you see a picture of one of these arachnoid granula uh, penetrating the meningeal layer of the dura mater. And uh, those red arrows are depicting the flow of cerebrospinal fluid out of uh, the, the cranial cavity into the, um, into the superior sagittal sinus where that fluid and waste materials will be drawn away. Um, in the, the larger picture, we see a schematic showing uh, along. So if you look along the surface of the uh, thalamus and that little white line there, which is the fornix, along the fornix and the, and the thalamus, you see the choroid plexus. Uh, the choroid plexus is where this uh, cerebrospinal fluid is being produced. It comes down through the ventricles, uh, third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, uh, and then emerges at the base of the uh, cere cerebellum into uh, the external space around the surface of the brain uh, and circulates up uh, along the... Um, the, the median fissure uh, towards the arachnoid granula in uh, the superior sagittal sinus. Okay, so that's the flow of cerebrospinal fluid through the brain. Any occlusion that may happen uh, in the cerebral aqueduct can, can lead to real problems, uh, enlargement of the ventricles um, and uh, hydrocephaly. All right, the blood-brain barrier. Um, so <clears throat> it's helping to isolate uh, the, the neural tissue from the general circulation. There's a lot of stuff in your blood that the neurons do not want to come into contact with. Um, there's this, this tight uh, puzzle piece interlock, uh, interlocking pattern of junctions between various uh, endothelial cells and uh, surrounding the uh, CNS capillaries. And then we have astrocytes, which are these glial cells, uh, on top of that, um, uh, that release various chemicals that control the permeability of this endothelium uh, from the, uh, from the uh, capillaries. All right, I'm going to flash through the cranial nerves real quick. And just to give you guys a, a quick uh, description of the function of each of the out, uh, cranial nerves. There's 12 of them. I showed you the diagram that, uh, that didn't come out very well in the lab, um, but that's in all your material. You have that stuff. First cranial nerve uh, to emerge uh, the most anteriorly from uh, the brain case is the olfactory nerve. Uh, we have this olfactory bulb that sits on either side of the uh, crystagalli. Uh, and sends fingers, little rootlets, uh, through the cribiform plate of the ethmoid down into the uh, top of the nasal sinus. Um, and uh, to invest the olfactory epithelium at the top of the nose. So this also is a, is a pretty good place to point out. Uh, you can see the uh, pituitary sitting down in the cella tersica over there. Uh, when you have uh, pituitary tumors, uh, the way that they deal with that is actually surgery through the nose. They, they'll break the bone in the back of the nasal cavity and, and operate through the nose um, on, on the pituitary. Otherwise, totally inaccessible. Uh, oh, here, I'll just say this before I move on. I, had, I used to live with this guy uh, when I was in graduate school, a strange fella. He lived in the basement the house. He um, had been in a car accident, I think, when he was young. And the, however he had gotten hurt, uh, those nerve rootlets that had uh, gone through the cribiform plate, he'd gotten hit somehow, uh, had been severed, and he had no sense of smell whatsoever. It was really odd. He only ate Wonder Bread and bologna sandwiches because he had very little sense of taste otherwise. It's odd. 
Uh, the optic nerve is the second nerve uh, to emerge from the brain. And uh, this is a pretty good diagram. It shows, uh, it shows the field of view, how nerves from various parts of the field of view are going to, uh, are going to radiate uh, into the uh, visual cortex. So we have the optic nerves coming back and sharing some of their fibers uh, across the optic chiasm. So there is, uh, there is a part of, so let me think, right, right about here and right about there. So this part of my field of view that's between my hands are the neurons that uh, are, being, are being shared across the optic chiasm, and then this, the other stuff is unique to each eyeball. Anyways, you, you share uh, visual in information between the right and left sides of the brain, and they, after the optic chiasm, they uh, proceed back through the optic tract um, and are going to synapse in the geniculate nucleus and the thalamus, and then you have these radiations back, uh, these projections back into the uh, occipital lobe, of the, which is your visual cortex. All right. Next, there are, there's a lot of, there's two cranial nerves and a lot of infrastructure put into controlling just the way you move your eyes. Uh, the first uh, of these uh, nerves is the ocular motor nerve. And uh, the ocular motor nerve controls the bulk, all but two, of uh, the extraocular eye muscles. There are, what, six, I think? Um, anyways, uh, they control a whole host of, uh, the oculomotor nerve, nerve three, controls a whole host of uh, eye muscles. And uh, also uh, has, so those are somatic efferents special somatic efferent fibers, right, that are going to control those uh, extraocular eye muscles. They also have a special, uh, special visceral efferent fibers that, uh, these are autonomic fibers, who are going to uh, synapse in this ciliary ganglion that lives right behind the eye. Uh, there's going to be a synapse there, and then uh, the pre- Ganglionic fibers are in the oculomotor nerve. The postganglionic fibers emerging from that go into the back of the eyeball and uh, help um, innervate the um, the ciliary body, which is going to control um, control the shape of your lens, help you in accommodation, uh, and also control uh, the size of your iris. Right. So all that is autonomics that is uh, outside your relational control. Uh, and then nerve number four, uh, is nerve number four shown here? Yeah, the trochlear nerve. So uh, cranial nerve number four is the trochlear nerve. This innervates the superior oblique muscle. So the label to superior oblique is in the upper left-hand corner. You can follow it um, down. Um, it's called the trochlear nerve. A trochlea is a hook. A trochlea just means a hook. And there is uh, this, this hook called the trochlea uh, that is made out of uh, this connective tissue that the superior oblique muscle wraps around. It wraps around this trochlea to completely change the direction of pull from this superior oblique muscle. Uh, that muscle is exclusively controlled by the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four. Um, and then cranial nerve five is uh, cut. We'll come back to the trigeminal nerve. The third nerve that controls uh, extraocular eye mu muscles is the abducens nerve. And we see that uh, right down here in the bottom. Uh, it controls the lateral rectus muscle. It has been cut in this picture. Um, what is abducens? Look at the first three letters of that word, or first five letters even. Uh, what does that, let, that word make you think that um, 
that muscle does. It abducts the eye. It pulls the eye away from the midline. Okay? So um, when thinking about that, you know, the, the muscle that's going to abduct the eye is the lateral rectus. Uh, you don't need to know that yet. You will uh, in the eye chapter. But um, it abducts the eye. Uh, so the abducens nerve is the one that abducts the eye. The trochlear nerve is the one that does the superior oblique, which is the muscle that wraps around the trochlea, uh, the trochlear nerve. And then the oculomotor nerve does everything else. Okay, so it's not as complicated as it, as it seems. Uh, the two special exceptions, the trochlear nerve and the abducens nerve, their names uh, are describe what they do, and then the oculomotor nerve does everything else. Um, you can you can see so you, you see where these nerves are emerging from the brainstem. They each come from very distinct places. The ocular motor nerve is coming off the midbrain. The trochlear nerve is wrapping around from the corpora quadrigemina. The the abducens nerve number six is coming from the base of the the, the, the margin of the pons and the medulla. Um, so. You, if there is a lesion, if there's a stroke or something like that in the brain stem, you can often, uh, like a neurologist or a neuro ophthalmologist, or even you, if you really know what the hell you're doing, can tell exactly where it is without seeing any MRI, without having to go through all that. You can already ha like have a pretty good sense of what's going on just by looking at the eyes and. <clears throat> Just at seeing if you can get the patient to move their eyes up and down and seeing the pattern of dysfunction in extraocular eye motions, uh, you can locate uh, the lesion just by really knowing the anatomy on this slide and how that's going to affect the way they can use their extraocular eye mu uh, muscles. It'll tell you a lot about uh, what's happening in the brain stem. So hopefully you guys will remember that someday and say, help save somebody's life. Um, okay, so there's the trigeminal nerve. Uh, <clears throat> the trigeminal nerve has, uh, as the name would indicate, three uh, heads, uh, three, three, it gives uh, rise to three branches. Uh, trigeminal nerve, it's cranial nerve number five. Um, and uh, we have the ophthalmic branch. Um, we have uh, that is sent, also sends some uh, fibers, some S, V, E fibers into the ciliary ganglion as well um, as the oculomotor nerve. And uh, that's going to go into the back of the orbit through the uh, superior ophthalmic uh, fissure. Then we have the maxillary branch which is heading out towards the surface of the face uh, through the, uh, the infraorbital uh, foramen. This is going to send some uh, fibers down to the pterygopalatine ganglion. One of the groups, whatever group, was, it was three women in the group. I don't remember exactly which three. I think it might have been you guys back here somewhere. Um, I went over, I talked about the pterygopalatine ganglion, and when I put a pipe cleaner through uh, the, the course that this maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve is uh, participating in, what is the foramen that that nerve is going through? Do you guys remember? I'm putting you on the spot. I really am. Uh, do you guys remember me talking about that? I think it was you guys, wasn't it? Is it one of you? I feel like it was, no. Who, who did I talk to about that with? Put a blue pipe cleaner through it. Anyways, it's the foramen rotundum. Uh, that's the, it's the foramen rotundum. Uh, that, oh, was it you? You're nodding your head. It might have been you I was talking to. I don't remember. But, um, so the foramen rotundum uh, is right in front of the foramen rotundum is this trigeminal nerve uh, ganglion, the semi, the quote, semilunar ganglion, like half moon ganglion. Uh, and that's this ball right where it says pons. It's that yellow ball right in front of it there. 
Uh, it's coming off of the pons. So that can help orient you a little bit when you're looking inside the skull and you look at the foramen uh, rotundum, that's right where the pons is going to sit. And that semilunar ganglion is sitting right there because the middle branch of the trigeminal, trigeminal nerve is coming out of that ganglion and then going right into the foramen rotundum. So it's good to like know what's going through those holes. It'll help you orient uh, the brain, you know, the, the bone anatomy with the neuroanatomy. Um, and then this, the third branch is the maxilla, the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. Sensory. It, 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 the trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve, meaning it's carrying a, a number of different uh, nerve fiber types. There's afferents, there's efferents, there's sensory and motor nerves, there is uh, general and special fibers, um, there's visceral fibers and somatic fibers. All right, next is the facial nerve, cranial nerve number uh, seven. And there's five branches to that, which I'm not going to ask you to know, uh, but they do maybe when you're in grad, uh, when you're in medical school, uh, this face thing. I don't know, any good anatomy professor is going to uh, describe it like that anyways. That's very common. Um, but it, it controls the facial musculature. So all of the things you can do with your face uh, are mostly uh, dependent upon the facial nerve. Um, and then it, it's carrying, um, yeah, well, let's, let's skip that. Let's keep going. You don't need to know the, all the different branches. The vestibular cochlear nerve, uh, cranial nerve 8, has two branches, the vestibular branch and the cochlear branch. The vestibular branch is responsible for balance, um, proprioception, uh, equilibrium, and then the cochlear branch uh, is responsible. That goes to the cochlea of the of the uh, inner ear is responsible for hearing. And they go in to the inner ear, so uh, they go into the inner ear through the internal acoustic meatus. I'm gonna get a pointer, uh, and they run along with the facial nerve. So this is how the facial nerve gets out of the brain as well. So seven and eight go both pass through. Uh, the internal acoustic meatus. Uh, the external acoustic meatus is out here, leading to the middle ear. What bone is this? What bone is this right there? You guys remember? I told, I remember telling the story to at least one group of you guys in the lab. I told, yeah. The petrous. Ding, ding, ding. Good job. Yeah, it's the petrous temporal bone. It's actually the densest bone in the body uh, because it is housing the three tiniest, most fragile bones in the body and this extremely delicate uh, architecture right there. So pe Peter means rock. Uh, like when I was telling that story, I whipped out a biblical, a biblical story. Jesus named uh, Simon Peter because he said, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Peter means rock. So the petrous temporal bone uh, contains all this stuff. The glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine. Um, coming off the, the medulla there, so you can see we're working our way posterior and inferior down uh, the, the front of the brain stem. Uh, glossopharyngeal nerve is responsible for this taste and then uh, saliva output loop, so afferent in terms of taste and efferent in terms of saliva output into the parotid gland, which is the gland that's right here uh, back by your ears underneath your, uh, underneath your zygomatic bone that you know, like you chew on a lemon and you kind of get it back there. That's the parotid gland sort of tweaking out. Uh, so the glossopharyngeal nerve uh, is basically taste and it's this afferent efferent gustation or taste loop in the back one-third of the tongue all right so the back one-third of the tongue um, next is the vagus nerve vagus means wanderer um, and like vagrant uh, the vagus nerve wanderer so-called because it truly does wander all over the body we find vagus nerve fibers all over the place. Uh, it controls um, aspects of 
swallowing and, and heart rate and, and uh, it goes down into the, into the viscera. Uh, here are some of the external, uh, the terminal branches, it goes to the lungs, the heart, the stomach, the liver, the intestines, the vag vag vagus nerve has fibers that go all over the place. Uh, and coming off of the brain stem. So I told you off the medulla oblongata. I told you the medulla controls heart rate. Uh, it can modify heart rate at least. It can, can modify uh, muscle tonus in the bronchioles and the lungs. It can help. Uh, it, it gives input to digestion, like all of this stuff, right? Um, that, that's what the medulla does. Well, it uses the vagus nerve to do it, all right? And, and so it makes sense that the vagus nerve is coming out of the medulla. Um, the accessory and hypoglossal nerves. Um, yeah. So, uh, again, muscles of um, swallowing. So, the hypoglossal nerve is muscles of swallowing. Uh, and both of them kind of uh, innervate what are called the strap muscles of the throat, these strap shaped muscles in the throat and neck. Uh, complicated nerves we don't need to go through. Um, okay. The cervical spine. So now that's the, that's the cranial nerves. We're just going to look at the, the spinal nerves. There are eight cervical spinal nerves. And they emerge from uh, the spinal cord. There are these ventral roots and dorsal roots that come together to form a spinal nerve. Ventral roots, dorsal roots. In the dorsal root, there's a ganglion. There's a dorsal root ganglion where we're going to have synapsing. All right? It's a ganglion. Uh, we went through the anatomy of the, of the cross section in lab. There are 12 thoracic spinal nerves. There are five lumbar spinal nerves, and then five sacral uh, spinal nerves, and one coccygeal nerve that comes out the very uh, bottom. At the bottom, uh, at the very, very tip, is this filum terminale, uh, which is a, basically a coccygeal li ligament that keeps the spine sort of tethered so it doesn't move around uh, in the spinal canal, vertebral canal. All right. So um, here is a posterior view of the spinal cord uh, with the dura mater. So the, the, the meninges that are in the brain just extend down into the, into the uh, spinal cord. There's a pia mater, there's the arachnoid mater, and there's the dura mater. And it's just extensions of the stuff up in the brain that come down and surround the spinal cord. Um, yeah, and we see again an, a depiction of the, the ventral and dorsal roots coming together to form the spinal nerve. Um, the distinction between the ventral and the dorsal root is going to become important when we talk about um, sensory and motor output. Okay. Uh, what am I trying to point out here? There's the denticulate ligaments. Is there anything else that's new? No, I want to keep going because I only have so much time here. All right. Yeah, this is good. So in the ventral root, uh, there are these motor fibers, and we have, in, so looking in the gray horns, the posterior lateral gray horns, uh, we're going to have these different nuclei. There's going to be motor nuclei, and there's going to be uh, sensory nuclei, nuclei, so efferent and afferent. And there's going to be separate areas for the somatic and the visceral, all right? So uh, this is all, is it all, all? It's mostly, I don't want to say all, I have to think about that for a second. It's mostly all general fibers, not special. But uh, if we assume that they're all general, there's G, right here, what we see depicted, we have G, uh, G S E, G V E, G, 
SA and GVA. So general somatic afferent, general visceral afferent, general somatic efferent, and general somatic afferent fibers. So sensory and motor fibers, both somatic, meaning skeletal muscles, and visceral, meaning autonomics, your sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic system, uh, all have their own nuclei. The sensory nuclei, the, both the somatic and the visceral, uh, that's coming in through this, dorsal, uh, through this dorsal root, passing through the dorsal root ganglion. The ventral is all motor nuclei, stuff that's coming out of the spinal cord. Okay? So the dorsal root and the ventral root are not, it doesn't mean that the dorsal root is just doing things in the back of the body and the ventral is doing things in the front of the body. It's not that. It's separated between motor and sensory, in and out. They're like in and out cables. All right, so that's the gray material. That's all I'm going to say about it. Um, and then there are the spinal tracts. So there are ascending tracts. Remember, the white are columns, which means they're axons that are going up and down. Uh, the ascending tracts are going to the brain somewhere, the thalamus probably, to, to synapse. And the descending tracts are motor fibers that are coming down uh, to go out to the muscles or to the glands or fat. So ascending tract is bringing sensory information up and the descending tracts down. Now, you see this has red on one side and green on the other. This doesn't mean that the ascending tracts are only on one side and the, and the descending tracts are only on the other. It's just separating them to the two different sides so you can get a sense. Uh, that both sides have ascending and descending tracts in mirror images of one another that are controlling the two sides of the body. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so here's another uh, uh, term, decussation. Uh, that's uh, a word that, another word that's used to describe uh, um, the transfer of a, of a fiber from one side to the body through one of these commissures. Um, it's where they cross over from yeah, the left to the right, either through one of the commissures in the spine or through the, uh, you can decussate through the corpus callosum in the brain. Uh, and then just two uh, descriptional terms, the term contralateral. So contralateral means uh, when you're describing two things, they're on opposite sides of the body, all right? So uh, you can have a cell body controlling something on a contralateral side of the body, or a cell body controlling something on the ipsilateral side of the body. Ipsilateral means on the same side of the body. Okay, So my left ear and my left eye are on ipsilateral sides of the body. My left ear and my right eye are on contralateral sides of the body, for example. But this is just uh, using it to refer to neurons. OK. So finally, I've been going for the last hour and a, uh, hour and a half here through really just a lot of setup to get to uh, some of the actual functioning of, of the nervous system. Okay, so sensory pathways, uh, this, is, this is actual functionally important stuff in my mind. Uh, sensory pathways, ha first of all, they're made of three neurons. Any sensory pathway is going to have three neurons, the first, second, and third order, order neuron. All right, a, a first order neuron is going to have a cell body either in the dorsal root ganglion or somewhere in a cranial nerve ganglion. All right? Um, and those are the, the ones that are picking up the sensation. Uh, second order neuron, the axon of that se uh, second order neuron, uh, uh, of the, of the, the axon of the primary. Uh, synapses and then the secondary neuron uh, synapses on some sort of interneuron in the CNS. The spinal, uh, the cell body, the soma, is going to either be in the spinal cord uh, or the brain stem somewhere. So there, the um, here is a primary neuron coming in, maybe synapsing here, and cell. I'm sorry, and cell body is here. We have a synapse in the spinal cord where the cell body of uh, the second order neuron is. And this is going to ascend some uh, 
some track, and it's gonna, if it reaches, if the sensation is gonna reach my consciousness, it's gonna have the synapse in the thalamus, all right? So, and, and then from the thalamus up to the brainstem, that's the third order, or up, up to the cortex, that's the third order neuron. So first one comes in to the spinal cord, synapses in the spinal cord, ascends to the thalamus, synapses there, third order goes uh, to the cortex. All right. So the first person to really be a, uh, to really map out the sensory pathways was this guy here, Wilder Penfield, uh, particularly for people interested in, in neuroscience. It's someone that it's worth knowing about. He's a really pretty interesting uh, character. Um, <clears throat> he, un he understood that we spatially localize uh, sensations from different parts of the body uh, because those sensory neurons ascend the sensory pathways and then synapse in unique cortical regions. Um, so uh, this is a great book to read where he describes uh, his investigation. It's called Mysteries of the Mind. This is the guy that did those sort of uh, cliché, now clichéd um, experiments where you had somebody awake undergoing op open, you know, brain surgery. They're, the, they have their brain, you know, the top of their skull is taken off and he's sticking an electrode into his brain and the person says, oh, I feel that in my elbow or, oh, my shoulder, I feel that there. He mapped out the brain. Um, <clears throat> doing those kinds of experiments and got this thing called the, he described this thing called the homunculus. Um, uh, he went to, oh, this was interesting too. He went to Oxford with William Osler and William Har and, and Harvey Cushing. Uh, and, uh, no, he was at Oxford with Osler and in New York with Harvey Cushing. These are two of the other, like, really foundational physicians that did all this stuff. Um, in, in the 20th century uh, in, in, in modern medicine. He was an interesting character. So we'll talk about the homunculus here. The sensory homunculus, it is a functional map uh, in the primary somatosensory cortex. So uh, the primary somatosensory cortex is this post-central gyrus, this blue one, this blue one right here. And along that gyrus is a little person. A little, a little jack is mapped out onto that gyrus in your brain, and it actually kind of looks like you. Uh, it is certainly uh, a depiction of the density of neurons in your body. So th the reason this homunculus may not actually look exactly like you, it looks distorted, because, um, well, you tell me, what do you think? Can anybody guess why the sensory homunculus doesn't look exactly the, in the terms of proportions like you? Yeah. Just because, like, the hand is really sensitive while the back is not. Yeah, okay. Right. So you have different receptive fields, different density of neurons. There's more neuro sensory neurons in your hands. So there's got to be more turf dedicated to it up in the primary somatosensory cortex. This is the homunculus, all right? So the area in the primary somatosensory cortex is proportional to the density of sensory receptors on the body. So you're going to have a lot more region <clears throat> in this primary somatosensory cortex, this homunculus, that is dedicated to the hand. The hand is a giant part. Uh, the lips, the genitals, that kind of thing. Whereas the rest of the body is not as uh, broadly depicted in this uh, primary somatosensory cortex. All right. The exact same thing exists in the primary motor cortex, which is in the precentral gyrus. So that, that uh, ridge of tissue that's in the front of the central sulcus, this is what is giving rise to all of the motor commands, all the motor commands that also map onto the body. So we have a lot of really fine motor control in the hands, right? 
we have a lot of fine motor control in our tongues and the musculature of our mouth and throat because we talk. Uh, not so much in our feet and back and butt and places like that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there is another sort of motor homunculus that is uh, mapped onto this um, precentral gyrus, the primary motor cortex. All right, so now that we, we talked about the sensory pathways going up and the homunculus and the interneurons up in the uh, post-central sulcus, and then we talked about the, the sensory homunculus and the post-central uh, gyrus and the uh, motor homunculus in the precentral gyrus, we're going to talk about the somatic motor pathways down, descending from the precentral uh, gyrus. Instead of having three neurons, there's only two. There's only two. Um, and <coughs> uh, they are upper motor neurons, and lower motor neurons. Um, upper motor neurons are ones whose cell bodies are contained in the cortex. They're in your gray matter. They're in the gray matter of the precentral uh, gyrus. They send their axons down either to emerge uh, via cranial nerves or uh, to emerge via uh, spinal nerves and synapse on skeletal muscle, these upper motor neurons are going to decussate. They're the ones that are going to go from one side of the body over to the other side of the body before they synapse. So they're going to synapse on the cell body of the lower motor neuron, but the cell body of the lower motor neuron is always on the opposite side of the body from the upper motor neuron. Okay? Um, <clears throat> Is there anything else I want to say? No. I could talk about There's upper motor neuron uh, disorder and lower motor neuron disorder. By looking at the person has a stroke, if you look at the pattern, like, like this side of their face is drooping, but their uh, other side of their body is drooping. I, I, I made the statement that the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron cell bodies are always on the same side of the body, uh, opposite sides of the body. That's not true. That's only true for... Um, uh, the ones that synapse in the spinal cord, the ones that emerge as cranial nerves, do not decussate, which is why you can have, um, you can have the, the one side of the face and the opposite side of the body or both sides of the face and, and the body uh, drooping in a stroke. That's going to tell you where the lesion is, but we're not going to go into that in more detail because um, we're running out of time. I talked about this already. This is uh, in lab. This is Epineurium surrounding an entire peripheral nerve, uh, perineurium surrounding the fascicles, and endoneurium uh, surrounding an individual cell. Uh, that, that's all. Okay, so here are, here are the dermatomes and the plexuses. So there are five, the, these spinal nerves as they emerge from the spine um, form these plexuses, and a plexus is just a nerve that merges with other nerves and then breaks apart and shares fibers into this big network. Uh, there's a cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is important uh, because it has uh, the phrenic nerve. You know, you can, you can mess up any of these other plexuses, like the brachial plexus, which is your upper body, the lumbar plexus, uh, which is your thighs, sacral plexus, and coccygeal plexus, which is your lower extremity. You can do the, you can cut those, interrupt those, and you're just going to be paraplegic or quadriplegic. But if you mess up your cervical plexus high enough up, you can uh, interrupt the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve is what innervates your diaphragm. If that happens, you can't breathe, and uh, and you will you will die if you're not gotten on artificial uh, ventilation quick enough. So cervical plexus is is the most important. Um, once they go through these, the nerves go through these plexuses, they form the true peripheral nerves, uh, and they innervate the sensorium along these dermatomes. There are these strips of skin that stripe your body that originate from each of these, uh, these different uh, segments, these spinal nerve segments, 
uh, that, that cover your body like so. So um, say you're having nerve loss somewhere because you have a ruptured disc. You have nerve loss, uh, a sensory loss somewhere, a par dysesthesia, uh, with, you know, some kind of dysesthesia. Uh, and you can find out exactly where that is without having to get a $3,000 MRI just by using your toothpick, pulling the toothpick out and poking along that person's skin to see where the, the sensory loss is. If it follows a dermatomal pattern, you can say, oh wow, this person must have a T5 uh, herniation that has an impingement on the left side because they've lost uh, their T5 dermatome on that side. All right. Um, so is that making sense? Another interesting aspect of this dermatomal structure is here's some pathology that goes with it is shingles. Anybody heard of shingles before? Have a grandma or a grandpa that has to get the shingles vaccine? Bad, uh, painful. It can happen to young people too. It, it's brought about, uh, it's the herpes zoster virus, uh, which surrounds all of us, is all over all of us. Uh, it is a painful blistering. Uh, the her this varicella uh, capsid lives. This virus lives inside the cell bodies um, uh, in the spinal cord. And uh, when you are under stress, it emerges and causes this rash along a dermatome. So you somebody comes in with a painful rash. Uh, only on one side of their body, and in, this, in a dermatomal pattern, bam, that is shingles. You know what you're looking at. Yeah. All right, we're almost out of time. Neuronal pools, I'll, I'll make these points. So you have about 10 million sensory neurons, you have about a half million uh, motor neurons, but damn, 20 billion of your neurons are interneurons. I spent this whole lecture talking about sensory and motor neurons, and I didn't even scratch the tiniest percentage of the neurons in, in your body. The vast majority of them are interneurons in the brain, and they're doing all kinds of things, uh, planning, interpreting, forming memories, learning, uh, et cetera. They form these neuronal pools, which is uh, the business of being you. Um, they can have a whole host of, of uh, synaptic uh, organization. They can have divergent signaling, where one neuron is going to go out to multiple neurons. You can have convergent, where multiple signals are coming into a signal. There's serial processing in a chain, parallel processing uh, side by side. There can be neuronal reverberations like this, so like feedback mechanisms, and there's different patterns that you can have there that either uh, amplify or, or attenuate uh, neuronal pathways. All right, so the last concept is the concept of reflex. Um, and I'm going to skip this slide. We'll just talk about what a, a reflex is briefly, and then I'm going to let you go in just a minute. Um, Events in a neural reflex. Step one, some kind of stimulus. You, you step on attack. Uh, the sensory receptor sends the signal through the, the prime, first order neuron to synapse in uh, one of the gray horns on an interneuron, uh, which is the second order. That, that interneuron then synapses on a motor neuron uh, that is in the uh, anterior uh, gray horn. And that's going to send a motor signal out to uh, some sort of, so this is, that's the inter information processing. And then the fourth step uh, is that a motor neuron that's been activated sends a signal out to an effector, a muscle. You pull the, the, the effector, it gets stimulated, and you re respond by pulling your hand off the tack. This uh, second order neuron can also send, doesn't have to, but can send a collateral branch up to the brain, to the thalamus, to let you know you just stepped on a tack. So that's that. Uh, I'm not going to go through the different types of uh, reflexes there, but there's a whole bunch of them. So here's a recap. 
Today I talked about the hierarchy of the nervous system in the CNS and PNS. I distinguish between efferent and afferent uh, um, neurons. I talked about what glial cells, is, glial cells are in the CNS and PNS. Uh, and then I went through the structures of the CNS and the PNS. Uh, and I touched on neuronal pools, and I just gave you a very brief definition of what a reflex is. Okay. Um, are there any questions? No? All right. Um,